Hello everyone, it's Zian over here from Nintendo Life, and we hope that you're ready to pick your house, because today we are finally able to share our review of Fire Emblem Three Houses on the Nintendo Switch. This review was originally written by Mitch Vogel and has been reforged into this video by me. Fire Emblem has been on quite a roller coaster journey on its path to success. After initial debut on the Famicom in 1990 with Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, the series remained a niche exclusive to the Land of the Rising Sun for 13 years until it made its way westward, spurred on by the appearance of Marth and Roy in Super Smash Bros. Melee. From there, it saw a fleeting rise in worldwide popularity, but declining sales by the time of the Wii's Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn led to Nintendo being just on the verge of canceling the series outright. Believing it to be their last crack at the series, the developers put their all into producing the seminal Fire Emblem Awakening on the 3DS, which turned out to be one of the best-selling titles for the platform and a much-needed shot in the arm for the storied RPG series. Since then, we've received sequels, remakes, and spin-offs galore, all of which have been pivotal in keeping the ball rolling, yet it feels almost like all of it has been leading up to the entry which has now arrived for the Switch. Fire Emblem Three Houses the first home console release for the series in over 10 years. We'll just go ahead and get one thing out of the way up front. Fire Emblem Three Houses is an absolutely wonderful strategy RPG experience. This is Fire Emblem dialed up to 11, perfectly balanced between the lessons learned from past titles, while also experimenting with bold new ideas the series has never attempted before. The story opens with your character, a mostly silent, blue-haired mercenary, saving a group of three school students from a nefarious band of bandits. And after a warm interaction in which your father recognizes some of the soldiers that they were traveling with, everyone romps back to the Garigmach Monastery, which houses the far-reaching Church of Saros and the Officers' Academy that it runs. Although the land of Fodlin is currently enjoying a rare time of peace between its three main nations, the school is always training and instructing the new generation of dignitaries, warriors, and nobles. Due to your father's long history with the Archbishop of the Church, your character is soon appointed as a professor, and you're given the choice to be the head of one of the titular three houses. Though the plot initially focuses on the simple and heartwarming school drama in which the day-to-day -day struggles of your students take center stage, there's an underlying conflict brewing behind the scenes regarding the church, your character's origins, and the world outside the walls of the monastery, which inevitably bubbles up into something considerably more pressing. What really struck us about the storytelling as the hours slipped by is just how effectively the pacing is handled when juggling what can initially feel like two separate stories, everything that happens inside and outside the wall. There were plenty of well-found concerns after Fire Emblem Three Houses was first revealed that the focus on school life in this release would lead to a certain flippancy in narration. Suffice to say, this two-toned approach to storytelling is inevitably united in an enormously satisfying way. But even in the early portions, you're always kept keenly aware of what's happening around you, even as you're focusing on helping a student navigate a tough relationship or find a lost item. What makes the story so compelling is unsurprisingly the strongly written cast of characters, each of which fills out their own niche and has deep, often complicated backstories to make them more three-dimensional. One character, for example, is an overwhelmingly paranoid introvert who usually overacts to every comment from her peers, positive or negative, and frequently finds excuses to lock herself in her room. Though her reactions to her classmates' invitations to things are often played for humor, getting to know her a little more through support conversations reveals that her insecurities and anxieties stem from a sad history with parental abuse. Not all characters have such a melancholy backstory, but we were rather taken aback at how every character has an extensive history and well-thought-out reason for their various quirks and interests. Everyone will of course have their favorite characters, but our hats are off to the developers for crafting such a broad, varied, and compelling cast. Even given the high bar set by previous Fire Emblem titles, we were impressed by the depth of the characterization here, and that connection to your team goes a long way into making each skirmish in battle feel that much more important. It's not just a cavalry unit you're sending to fight that ruffian, but a student with a name who you spent a lot of time getting to know both in and out of the classroom, and whose growth has been guided by your knowledge. Fire Emblem Three Houses progresses over a period of several years, which are usually broken up into small chapters that take a month each. Usually there's a climactic battle or event taking place at the end of the month, and the weeks preceding it are spent preparing your character and team for the coming event. To be fair, the only days of the month that really concern you as the player are the weekends, in which you're given free time on one day and must give a lecture on the other. 
The other days are still important, as birthdays and other emergent events can sometimes occur, but the bulk of your time is going to be spent on best managing what you do with those critical two days of each week. The free days allow you to do one of four primary activities, rest, seminar, battle, or explore. One of the biggest features of Fire Emblem Three Houses, and to be frank, the least Fire Emblem-ish element to the game, is the monastery that so much of the plot revolves around. If you opt to explore on your free days, you can roam freely around the expansive grounds of the campus and do things like fishing, dining with students and faculty, gardening, or just pick up a few simple side quests. Now on the surface, these things may seem like they only amount to senseless busy work to pad out the experience by a significant degree. But what's effective about this freeform experience is how everything you do carries neatly back into the core gameplay of turn-based battles. For example, eating with students will raise the support level between everyone participating and raise their motivation too, which will affect how attentive they are in class, and in turn, the kind of stat gains they can experience. Another example can be seen in how doing favors and quests for people will grant you renown, which can be later spent on passive buffs that will increase the experience gained by all units. No effort you make here in the monastery is wasted, and it's all effective in how it contextualizes all various relationships and characterizes the cast in a more passive way. Being able to greet a student on the way to the chapel, for instance, helps to make the monastery and its occupants feel that much more real, especially given that most characters always have something unique or new to say. These monastery segments are also where the many comparisons to the Persona series are most aptly drawn, particularly in how emphasis is placed on time management. Your character has a professor level that increases every time you do another activity, and when it goes up, you're given access to more activity points among other bonuses. Activity points govern everything you do in the monastery, and you only have a handful of them to begin with, so you must be choosy with how you spend your time. You could, for instance, spend them all doing faculty training with various other professors, which would help boost your main character's stats, but at the cost of your students not seeing much growth. Or you could spend them getting tea or lunch with certain characters, but while yourself off from getting able to participate in choir practice with them. The idea of give and take pervades everything you do in the monastery and beyond. No choice you make is ever truly wasted, but you simply won't be able to do everything at once. Indeed, this can induce a modicum of anxiety over maximizing efficiency and doing things the right way. But we rather appreciated how similar it felt to the decisions you were making when ordering units on a battlefield. It forces you to prioritize what's important and what can be allowed to slide. Usually the day after your free day is when instructing will take place. And this is where you can exert control over the current growth your students are going through. Everyone has varying levels of proficiency in different weapon types. And though usage on the battlefield will shore these up, significant jumps can be achieved in the classroom. Your professor level will dictate how many students you can work with for that day, and it then becomes a matter of selecting which students you want to tutor and which skills you want to work with for that session. Each lesson will add a randomized amount to the chosen stat, depending on how well the student did. And if things went exceptionally poor or well, you can even critique or praise the student to add a little more to their motivation. This instruction element goes a long way towards reinforcing the student-teacher relationship between your class and your character, rather than feeling just like another student at the monastery. These instruction days are great on their own as a story beat, but we also appreciate how much influence they allow you over your character's stats. This is easily the most you've ever been able to control character growth in a Fire Emblem game. Every character starts with certain weapon skills higher than others, but if you'd rather train a magic-focused character into an axe wielder instead, you can certainly do so with the right time and dedication. It's rare that a game finds such a neat way to marry its story with specific gameplay elements in such a logical way. Each character can be every class, but in order to reclass them, the character must first pass an exam to become certified in the new class. The prerequisites to pass are based on having a minimum proficiency in certain weapon skills, but notably you don't have to completely fulfill prerequisites to have the character take the exam. Exams can be taken as many times as needed, but each unit can only take one exam per day, and each exam will cost a precious seal. You're encouraged to take your time with promotions, however, because even though they bring with them new stat buffs and abilities, you can also earn rare and effective new abilities by maxing out a character's mastery of their current class. Like in other areas of the game, this introduces more of that give and take principle. Do you move on to the next class at first opportunity, or do you master the one you're in currently and reap the benefits? Luckily, a character can reclass into any certified classes at any given time, so there's no element of losing what you once had, but there is a certain amount of critical decision-making that will take place every time someone is eligible to switch. 
It's nice that the system of class changing is made a little more forgiving compared to past entries, especially in how it gives you access to all classes a character has assumed. And we particularly appreciated the flexibility that it offers in team building. Nobody is pigeonholed or forced into a certain tree, and you can make tweaks as you go if you find that you use a character more for one purpose than the other. In the field of battle, events unfold largely the same as they have in past entries which should come as a relief to many longtime fans. You command a group of usually around a dozen units across a grid-like map in turn-based battles, picking and choosing matchups as you see fit. When two units collide, the results are one part random and one part decided based on the given stats of the characters entering the conflict. A helpful forecast, if you will, window will show you exactly the damage that will be given and received if you order a unit to attack an enemy. And you can even cycle between weapons and weapon arts to see how the numbers can be stacked in your favor. Once you initiate the conflict, the randomness is introduced into the form of accuracy and critical chance, with there being chances of either unit's attacks either missing completely or doing extra damage. Should you make a mistake, and you surely will at some point, you can then trigger a helpful Divine Pulse, which allows you to rewind the clock and try again. You only get a few uses of this ability per battle, but it's a lovely way of allowing one to try out bold maneuvers, or to undo a silly mistake without necessitating that you start over the whole battle. Fans of the series that enjoy the punishment brought on by permadeath and the like will no doubt cry foul at this, but it's blessedly not a feature that you're forced to use if you don't want to. Most notably, the rock-paper-scissors style weapon triangle the series has become known for has been completely tossed out which may come as a disappointment to some, but not all are equal. However, as the developers have seen to it that certain matchups, such as archers doing extra damage to flying units, have still been kept in. Additionally, higher proficiencies in weapon types will allow a character to be more effective against some other types, such as how the Axe Breaker skill will grant a high-level Lance Wielder extra stats when facing off against an Axe unit. It is a little bit weird at first when one doesn't have to worry as much about unit placement because of the weapon triangle removal, but we rather enjoyed how it increased viability across the board. You can be riskier with your tactics and pull off matchups that were never possible before, and now a unit's stats have more weight because they can't just fall back on weapon type superiority anymore. One feature that's seen a return in this release is the reintroduction of weapon durability, and this is tied in part to the new art system. As a unit climbs in proficiency with a given weapon type, they'll unlock new weapon arts that give them greater agency when using that weapon against an enemy. For example, the Bane of Monsters art for sword users will do enhanced damage in general, but especially high damage to monster-type units. The catch to using these arts, however, is that they take a much larger toll on your weapon's durability. Using Deadeye on a bow user, for example, will give them both higher range and damage, but it will also knock a whole 5 points off the equipped weapon's durability versus the normal 1. New to Fire Emblem Three Houses is the Battalion System which takes things beyond the 1v1 battles of games past and introduces more large-scale fights. Think of a battalion as a sort of special attack or a summon. They can only be triggered a couple of times per battle, but the effects are often game-changing. When you use a battalion, not only does your character deal a ton of damage while taking none, but there's usually a secondary effect as a result of the attack, such as the enemy unit not being able to move the next turn. Every battalion is compromised of different kinds of soldiers that have different attack styles, and these can be leveled independently of the character they're equipped on to increase their effectiveness. Every battalion will boost the stats of their characters to a certain degree, but the trade-off is that whether or not you use them in a turn, their endurance will slowly go down. Not only will this gradually make your battalion attack weaker, but it will eventually result in a battalion leaving the unit and going back to the guild. Aside from the obvious joy of watching an army of men charge down a hill to waste an enemy unit, battalions are a welcome addition to the Fire Emblem formula in how they offer both passive and active benefits that can really change the tide of battle if you use them wisely. However, if you don't want to bother with them, you can also largely ignore this element of the combat system and still have a completely fair and fun experience. Though there's no direct online multiplayer to speak of, online features are still present in a more passive sense. For example, the Spirits of the Fallen feature will create purple and yellow tinged tiles on the battlefield in places where other players felled enemies or were cut down themselves. If you move a unit over one of these tiles, you can then receive benefits like new equipment or a bump in experience. Additionally, on free days, you can see what percentage of players picked which options for that day, which can go a long way into helping you decide whether to spend that day exploring the monastery or grinding out battles and paralogs. It's admittedly a bit disappointing that you can't directly play against other players in a typical battle setting, but the inclusion of these neat little online bonuses is still welcome, especially in seeing the decisions others have been making in their journeys. 
As for its presentation, Fire Emblem Three Houses isn't exactly a system showcase, but it's easily the best looking title in the series to date. The missing feet and chibi-like characters of the 3D games have been replaced by a much more visually striking cel-shaded art style, with more realistically proportioned characters. Character portraits and models are both exceptionally detailed, and colors, such as a character's vibrant green hair, pop in ways that no previous entry has achieved, although it all comes at the cost of somewhat lacking performance in docked or handheld mode. For example, when running around the monastery, or even moving the cursor around large maps, the frame rate tends to take a noticeable dip. This being a slow-paced game, the frame drops are certainly more forgivable than they would be in a more action-heavy release like Breath of the Wild, but their presence at all is rather head-scratching at best. Fire Emblem Three Houses doesn't come off as particularly hard on the Switch's hardware, but if the frame rates are anything to go by, it must be. This isn't even including the pop-in that sometimes occurs on the battlefield, in which trees or other decorations behind the fighting characters will jump in and out of their existence with each footstep and clash of swords. Now it may sound like Fire Emblem Three Houses is a technical mess, but this couldn't be further from the truth. For the majority of your time, things will be running smoothly and you'll barely notice any hiccups, but the interruptions occur just frequently enough that they do tend to take you out of the experience. Although the visuals don't fully stick the landing, the soundtrack composed by Takura Kanazaki hits all the right beats, nailing the perfect balance between sounding both dreamlike and epic in scope. Whether it be the ethereal whispering voices of the spirit deus, or the thundering percussion and intense strings of tearing through heaven, this is a wonderfully diverse and interesting soundtrack that's packed with quality tunes. Following on from this excellent soundtrack, we feel that the voice acting deserves a particular shout out. Every single line of dialogue has been voiced this time around, avoiding the various grunts that previous releases ran with, and we haven't yet heard a voice actor that doesn't seem to be giving it their all. Each character has a memorable identity to their cadence or accent, and the focus on voicing every line of dialogue goes that extra mile in further humanizing these characters and giving them more dimension. There was a lot riding on it, but we can confidently say that Fire Emblem Three Houses has managed to live up to the hype and will stand as a highlight in the series for years to come. The expanded gameplay styles, retooled combat, lovable characters, and in-depth character customization hook you fast and are almost guaranteed to keep you engaged for dozens, if not hundreds of hours as you come to understand this enormous game in its entirety. Fans both new and old won't want to miss out on what Fire Emblem Three Houses has to offer. This sets a new standard for what a strategy RPG can be, and most certainly proves itself to be the next must-have release for the Nintendo Switch. We here at Nintendo Life give Fire Emblem Three Houses on the Nintendo Switch a 9 out of 10. If you'd like to read the written version of our review, you can find it over at nintendolife.com. Oh, wow.